So we are concluding, we're wrapping up this morning a sermon series that we've been calling Life Comes At You Fast. And for the last four weeks, we have been taking an overview of the spiritual journey through each of the four stages of life, paying attention to some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities that exist in each of them. And we have been using the life of David, King David in the Old Testament, as our guide. And this morning, we're going to look at the end of David's life. Now, where we pick up on the story is that David has lived a long, full life, that he's ruled as king. He has been prolific as a writer of the Psalms. Over half of the Psalms that exist in Scripture are written or attributed to King David, written about the events of his life. But what you need to know is that there are essentially two very distinct accounts of the last stage of David's life. There's one in First Chronicles that you'll hear in just a minute that is uh, a rather idealized version of this period in his life. And in other places in the Old Testament, places like First Kings and Second Samuel, there's another side of the story. But for now, I invite you to sit back and to listen as we hear the more idealized, glowing version of the end of David's life. Our scripture today comes from 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 26 through 28. Here begins the reading. Thus David, son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel. The period that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. He died in a good old age, full of days full of riches, and his son Solomon succeeded him. That's the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So this morning we are talking about older adulthood. For the last four weeks we've looked at childhood, we've looked at adolescence, we've looked at adulthood or midlife, and today we're going to talk about older adulthood and and. Renee was right that there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of tension in the congregation this morning about exactly when does that phase start. Uh, now, here's what I want you to know is that I may be dumb, but I am not stupid. And I'm going to let you determine for yourself when that phase begins in life. As Bernard Baruch, who lived to be 95 years old, once said, older adulthood is 15 years older than whatever I am right now. And I'll let you define how that is. Part of the reason that it's difficult to define when that starts is because the lifespan of the human life is expanding rapidly. If you were born in the year 1900, your life expectancy was only about 40 years. If you were born in the year 2000, that number was close to 80, almost double. And some say with the advances in modern medicine, that could significantly increase in the very near future. I received an email this last week uh, from a gentleman in our congregation who was inspired by my sermon last week on midlife. And he said, though, Russ, he says, I'm not sure that I fit in the midlife category. He said, I did the math, and if this is midlife, I will live to be 176. <laughs> to which I said, Eldon, the life expectancy <laughs> rates are climbing. They are climbing. So it's not just hard to define, but I would argue that it's also difficult to name. So what do we call this stage in our life? Do we call it older adulthood? Anytime we use the word old, it becomes difficult, it becomes contentious. Someone suggested, and I love this, chronologically enhanced population. I thought that was very nice, much nicer than saying old people. But the church that I served in Atlanta a number of years ago had a very active senior adult ministry. Uh, they referred to that group as the Third Agers Club, which I loved. It's a phrase used to define that period of time that is after middle age, but while people are still active, I like that, the third age. Now, I need to confess right off the top that I struggled putting this sermon together much more so than the other three. In fact, I worked hard, harder on this one. It took longer to write this sermon than the other three, perhaps even combined. And part of the reason is because I've not experienced this stage yet. 
despite what my children will tell you. I've been a child. I've been an adolescent. I've gone through midlife, crisis and all. But I don't yet have the experience of this evening of life. I don't know what it's like to experience my physical powers diminish, although my children will laugh at me when I pull out my phone to use the light in order to read a menu in a restaurant. How many people know exactly what I'm talking about? I don't know what it's like to retire from work, to give up my career. I don't know what it's like to see a number of my peers pass away. And so all that to say, today I preach as an observer of dealing and working alongside people of this age in over 30 years of ministry, of what I've witnessed in others, of what I've read and studied about. And what I have come to discover is that this age, this stage in life, essentially, however you want to define it, however you want to label it, is that the focus of this period of life is more on being than doing. It's more on being than doing, and this is difficult for many of us because regardless of our age, we are all children of the Protestant work ethic. You know the story, 500 years ago, there was a reformation that took place and ushered in what is now known as the Protestant work ethic, which said essentially in many ways that that you have no value unless you are doing something, unless you're creating, producing, working, that God appreciates and loves and values what you do. But I would argue just the opposite. My theology, our theology is that God has value in our being. That God cares a whole lot less about what we do than simply who we are. And that there is a time that we catch up to that most essentially, typically in this third age of our life. You know, the funny thing about getting older is that your eyesight does tend to get weaker, but yet your ability to see more clearly what really, what truly matters becomes even more clear than before. You come to see and truly know at a deeper level that family truly is everything, that learning is a a lifelong experience, that curiosity is the key to living a long, fulfilled life. And ultimately, you come to see that in the long run, it is the little, the simple things that matter the most. As someone once said, the older I get, the more I realize that I just need the simple things in life, a comfortable home, good food on the table, to be surrounded by people I love. It's an older older adulthood when we come to see this more clearly. So my main point this morning is whether old age is good news or bad news is directly dependent upon the choices and the habits that we have developed earlier in life, in our childhood, in our adolescence, and in our midlife. And we see that in David's life, that in his older ages, he was a culmination of what he had been becoming throughout his entire life. As Richard Rohr, the great Catholic priest who wrote a book about the spirituality, about the two halves of life. He called it falling upward. And in it, he said this. He said, watch your thoughts because they become words. Watch your words because they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits because they become your character. Watch your character because that becomes your destiny. What we see is that life really is the culmination of what we have been becoming for years. I mentioned earlier that the Bible gives us two sides of the story of the last stage of David's life. There's the part that we read just a moment ago that David died at old age, full of glory, and his son Solomon ruled after him, sort of the, and they lived happily ever after version of the story. But the truth is, is if we know, if we've been reading along, if we've been paying attention, we know that they didn't just live happily ever after. As we discussed last week, nobody lives happily ever after. Life was difficult at times for David. His life in many places, in many ways, was a bit of a mess. And so we look at the fuller story that we see in 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, the, the struggles that had characterized his life to that point. 
where Absalom, his, his oldest son, the apple of his eye, as he once said, the logical heir to the throne. But Absalom grew impatient. He wanted to be in power now, and so he devised a plan in order to, to have his father killed, but in that process, end up being killed himself. And we hear David cry of, of rage, of anger, of pain, Absalom, Absalom. It was the prophet Nathan, the very one who had earlier in life held up the mirror to him in the situation around Bathsheba and says, you, you are the one who has sinned here. It was that very same prophet who stepped in and said, Solomon, Solomon's the, the one who shall be king. But David said, well, wait a minute, he's never even been in battle He's never served in the army. And Nathan says, no. But he is filled with wisdom. Just a side note, parenthetically, for a moment, if you will. What do you think is needed most in our world right now? More armament or more wisdom? Perhaps that's a sermon for another time. The point is, is that David is the accumulation of what he was becoming at every stage of his life, in all stages in life of preparation for this time. My grandfather, Grandpa Pete, as I like to call him, was a hero to me. He spent his entire life on a ranch here in Texas, and as we know, everything is bigger in Texas, and Grandpa Pete was larger than life in my eyes. He was my hero, even though his name was Vincent Matthew. Everyone simply called him Pete, and I loved him. In fact, I named my son after him. Years after he died, my father reluctantly told me about some of the other side of the chapters of his life, things that I didn't know, times when his life was less than perfect. And after hearing all that, after knowing the, the full story, here's the thing. I loved him even more. I loved him even more than I knew the whole story. And he was not to be placed on a pedestal, but he was real. He was genuine. He struggled just like the rest of us. I loved him even more. Do you remember the story of the Velveteen Rabbit? It's a children's story, of course, but I would argue that it's really for all of us. It's the story of a box full of children, or excuse me, a box full of toys, and every night after the, the boy would go to sleep, the toys would come alive. And one of them, the Velveteen Rabbit, befriended the oldest, most mature toy in the box, the skin horse. The skin horse had become real over time, and, and, and the Velveteen Rabbit asked, how did this happen? And he says, essentially, it's how we're made. It's not necessarily how we're made. It's a, it's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then in that moment, you become real. Well, how does this happen? Does it happen all at once or along the way? He says, no, 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 no. It takes a while. And it doesn't happen to those things that are rigid, filled with mechanics and generally he says by the time you are real and church hear me when I say this this is the best part by the time you are real most of your hair has been loved off oh I love that part <laughs> I love that part by the time you are real most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter to you. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly. Except to people who don't understand. It was once I knew the fuller story of Grandpa Pete. That I knew that he was real. And I loved him even more. David in his older years is the accumulation of what he was becoming at every stage in his life, and the truth is, we all are. Now, let me be clear. That's not to say that we are tragically stuck, and as a result of all the decisions, change can happen. I'm a firm believer in transformation that happens, can happen in all of our lives. But generally, who we are, what we are, 
is the accumulation of what we have been becoming at every stage previously. I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, and this whole idea of aging is, is a pretty big issue, a pretty big topic. In fact, right now, there are tons of books and lots of research that's being done. And just this last week, Sanjay Gupta of CNN phase fame launched a new po podcast on this very easy issue, a season that he is calling Chasing Life. It's all about getting older. Now, I can't say for sure that he did this podcast in response to this sermon series. I can't say that for sure. But I can't say it wasn't either. But in it, he pointed out that, that one of the things is that we have as a culture, we have a fascination, we have an obsession, we have a, a fear of aging in our culture. In fact, aging in many ways is, is a dirty word. I want you to think for just a minute about the billions and billions of dollars that we spend every year on things like plastic surgery, hair color in order to, to keep the gray away, all the anti-aging creams, all the Botox, you name it. Anti-aging is huge business. And a lot of that has impacted our preconceived notion of what it means to get older. But a lot of those beliefs, a lot of those fears are, are thrust upon us by this quest to stay young, even though getting old is not nearly as bad as some people make it out to be. In fact, I know people who say this age of life is their favorite. It's the time when they've got the most wisdom, they've got the most freedom. They can do whatever they want. They've got the benefit, the blessing of being a grandparent who many say is much better than being a parent. My father is the one that tells me all the time, if I would have known how much fun grandchildren are, I would have had them first. <laughs> one of the people that Gupta interviews, a Yale professor by the name of Becca Levy, explains that how we feel about aging greatly impacts not just the quality, but also the longevity of our lives. That if we have a, a negative belief about aging, that that can greatly impact our emotional, our spiritual, and our physical health. But if we have a more positive view on aging, not only are we happier, more content, but research shows that those people with a positive understanding of aging live seven and a half years longer than those who are afraid of getting old. The research backs it up. But yet, much of our culture, there's this sense that if you're not young anymore, you're irrelevant, you're boring, that you don't have anything left to give us. Now, let me just be clear that that message doesn't just come from younger generations. Let me tell you what has been my experience in serving the church for nearly 30 years, that oftentimes it is the older folks they just sit back. They put their hands up and say, I, I don't have anything left to contribute anymore. Either that or, you know what, I've done my time. It's somebody else's responsibility now. But either way, they leave it up to someone else. And the only way they participate is to be critical of the way that the next generation is doing things. And are quick to complain that they aren't the way things used to be. That sort of thing doesn't happen at University Christian Church, but at other churches, I've heard that that's the case. But in many cultures, for thousands of years, there has been this idea, this role of the village elder, the one who had seen it all. And when you are a young person and you're trying to figure it out, trying to sort it all out, what matters and what doesn't, when you're trying to make it all work, you would go to the village elder who is a fount of wisdom, a non-judgmental, non-anxious presence who had seen it all and was more than helpful in helping you sort it out. Here's the thing. To all of our chronologically enhanced population, we need you now more than ever. 
we need you now more than ever because you have the time, you have the wisdom, you have the resources. We need what you have now more than ever. You've been married how long? Been able to stay together? We need your wisdom. We need your insight because right now we have young families that are struggling, trying to figure it out how to balance family and faith and kids and work. And we need your insight and your wisdom. You know how to read? You're free in the afternoons? Well, perfect. Because there's a school just down the street that would love to have you to come and to read to their fourth grade students and to mentor them and to love them and to show that someone cares outside of their home. I could go on and on and on about all of the ways that we need the village elder now more than ever. But what's happened in our culture is that the generations have split. The younger people feel like that that, that they've got it all figured out, that, that the older folks are irrelevant. And those older folks feel left out. And so there's this gulf. But in many cultures, with the village elder, they are all integrated because they realize, they realize that they need each other. That the older generations need the, the passion and the, the idealism. They need the energy of youth and the youth understand that there are people who have been there, who have got it figured out, that can help guide me. We need the village elder now more than ever. So the Bible, as I said, wrote two endings to the story of the life of David. The hard one with the son who tried to kill him in order to get the crown. And the nice story of a long life full of glory. The truth is that both sides are needed in order to tell the full story of David's life, and I would argue that the same is true for our lives as well. As Dag Hammarskjöld, former Secretary of the United States or the United Nations, once said, "For all that has been, thanks, and for all that will be, yes." You see, for both sides of the story, the full story that marks all of our lives, for those moments of saintliness as well as those sad choices, we simply say yes. What we discover in life is that life can be lived only looking forward, but it can be understood only looking backwards. And yes, life comes at you fast. And as we look back upon our lives, this mixture of saintliness and sad choices, may we be able to turn to God and to say, for all that has been God, thanks. And for all that can be and will be, yes.
let us pray. Oh God, as we dedicate this offering for the wide work of the church, let us be ever mindful of the incredible gifts and talents you have so generously entrusted to each of us in our church community. Accept our gifts and ourselves and help us all to resolve to share that bounty to advance Christ's work throughout our life's journey. Amen. Please be seated. I'm thinking about my grandparents' table this morning. I'm thinking about all I learned sitting at that table. The table always looked pretty much the same. Um, always the best dishes would be there if we were there for the weekend. And my grandmother's greatest hits because she was a great cook. But mostly I remember, I remember the stories that were told. I remember that they normally had a funny ending. Making people laugh is a part of the value system in my family. So they were funny stories and they were stories about my grandmother and my granddad's memories of their life. And even though the table didn't change much and the menu stayed the same, which is what we wanted, that table spoke to me at, very, at all the stages of my life. It was always about who I was as I considered those relationships around the table. And I think about how much we learn at this table about who God is, how this meal speaks to us, no matter whether we're just beginning our faith journey or way down the road, the table meets us, it greets us with grace, and it supplies what we need at every stage in our life. We come to this table every Sunday, and we remember the night that Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. After they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you, this is the new covenant poured out in my love. And each time you break this bread and share this cup, remember me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this special time in our worship when we commune with you and focus on our personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to realize that your spirit is always at work in our lives. As we share this meal, bind us all together as one family, ever filled with your love. Bless our partaking of this sacred meal and grant us your grace and strength to be ever faithful disciples. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let me invite you as the bread is passed to take it and then to wait and hold the cup until we're all served and we will take it together. This is God's grace made known to us in Jesus Christ. <laughs> 